Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is July 20th, 2011, and my guest is Keith Hennessy, a research fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Keith, welcome to Econ Talk. Thanks. Keith, you were an economic advisor to President Bush, as well as a staffer for Trent Lott, I think when he was majority leader, is that right? That's right. So I've come to you for uh, wisdom about a very complicated and dry subject that is in the news certainly this week and maybe beyond, uh, which is the budget and the current discussion of the debt ceiling, which for me is a somewhat mystifying subject, and I think for a lot of people. So uh, I'm, I'm hoping to ask you a lot of stupid questions, and I hope you give me smart answers. So, I, I can't promise you wisdom, but I <laughs> promise to explain things as I understand them. That's great. Um, so the day that people are talking about as an important day is August 2nd. On August 2nd, evidently, if the debt ceiling, which is currently at a mere $14.29 trillion, if that is not lifted, that debt ceiling is not uh, raised, my understanding is we're going to, the U.S. government will not have enough money to meet its obligations. Is that, is that a correct statement? Is that why August 2nd is important? That's why August 2nd is important. Uh, based on information provided by the Treasury Department. So there are a few things to understand about that. Uh, the first thing is that what that means is that Treasury and OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, they have their cash and debt management plans, and it means that Treasury does not think that they will have sufficient cash both to pay interest and principal on debt obligations and to make all of the other payments that they're scheduled to make whether those are benefit payments or payments to states or payments to contractors. So it's been described as the United States government will default, and the word default is, is one that you have to be careful with because default is a technical term that means not pay our debt obligations to those out there in the rest of the world from whom we've borrowed money. American citizens and foreign citizens, governments, etc. Whoever it is who has lent the U.S. government money. Right. Um, we will have enough cash, at least for a while, <laughs> to pay that money. To pay that, sure. What we won't have is enough cash to pay that and everything else that the government needs to pay on the normal schedule that it normally pays. Which would be payments to Social Security recipients, federal employees, soldiers, doctors and hospitals, soldiers, veterans, uh, reimbursements to states for highways and unemployment insurance and Medicaid and welfare. Uh, road building contractors, everything that the government spends money so, on. So that August 2nd date, which was mentioned quite a while back, that's a forecast. Of course, many of the obligations of the U.S. government are quite predictable. We know what the salaries are that, that the employees are paid on a regular ongoing basis. Uh, we know what debt obligations come due on certain dates, certain bonds mature, certain outstanding interest payments have to be made. Uh, some of it, though, Two sides of it are uncertain, which are the inflow, right? The tax receipts are obviously, people pay estimated taxes at different times. Um, and there are other fees, I presume, that the federal government corrects, connects, collects, excuse me. And um, there is also ambiguity about some of the outflows. So why is, where does August, August 2nd is a forecast? So August 2nd is a forecast. They're actually... Is it going to be August 3rd or August 1st, in which case we don't mind, we don't, it might have a little more time or a little less time, right? It, it, it absolutely could. So there are, uh, the, the comparison legislatively is always with a continuing resolution and a government shutdown, which we dealt with in the spring. And with a government shutdown, there's a provision in law that says at a specific moment, on a specific day, the government is no longer allowed to spend money. That is a very hard and very precise deadline. The debt limit is a mushier deadline for two reasons. One is the reason you described, which is you're making projections about the cash coming in and the cash going out. The other is that Treasury has certain uh, tools that it can use to manage its debt. 
These tools are all bad fiscal policy. They're all bad debt management policy. But if your choice is between doing something that's bad debt manage- management policy and defaulting on a treasury obligation, you do the bad policy. Yeah, it seems like it's a choice. <clears throat> what treasury has is they have a list of those things that go from least worst policy to most worst policy, and they draw a line on that list. And they draw that line, they make a judgment call, and they say, look, once we get below this line, we're doing things that are too legally sketchy, too bad policy, we're not going to go below that line. So given where we've drawn that line, and given our projections of cash inflows and cash outflows, what does that produce? And that produces a date August of August 2nd. second. Can, can we backtrack for a minute? Because you mentioned uh, two phrases that are mystifying to me to some extent. Again, I have a vague idea what they mean, but uh, continuing resolution and government shutdown. Now, I, I think the right phrase would be, sentence would be, if the government does not have a continuing resolution, there could be a government shutdown. Is that which is a different thing that we're talking about right now, right? I just want to make it clear to people listening out there. But it often gets mentioned, you know, that this is a threat point for either side. Uh, to, and that would be a case where the government would not have the legal authority to go forward because this, the Congress has not passed a budget resolution? Correct. So there are two types of spending, two classifications for spending. There's discretionary spending. A phrase is, I hate. Right, which is otherwise known as annual appropriations. That is spending that Congress makes decisions every year. They pass a law every year, and the president has to sign it. There are 12 of those bills. And the key is that if... 12 of those bills? 12 appropriations. Over the course of... Over the course of each year, those 12 bills are supposed to be passed by the House and Senate and signed into law. And but the 12, is that monthly, or is that just a coincidence that it's 12? That's just a coincidence. Okay. It used Sorry. to be 13, it's now 12. Okay. It's a jurisdictional aspect of okay. Congress. Um, so let's take something like the national parks. The national parks are part of, they're an element of one of those 12 annual appropriations bills. Department of the Interior. <clears throat> the tar- Department of the Interior. If the Interior Appropriations Bill is for not, some reason not passed and signed into law, then there is no funding that can legally be spent. There's cash avail- there may be cash available, but the Department of Interior is not allowed to spend any money. Okay. And so the Department of Interior shuts down. The national parks would close. The federal government's fiscal year operates. And, 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 excuse me, and park rangers would get a note, a letter or an email saying, do not Same. come into work today. Don't show up at work on October 1st. Who locks the door? <laughs> to Yosemite. Or... Yeah, what, well, what they actually do is they say, unless you are an essential employee, Right, another and then category some, you hear. Right, somewhere, someone at the Department of the Interior, maybe the head of the National Park Service, says we'll have three S- rangers at every park. Skeletal staff. Who will, do, who, right, will, okay. who will lock the door and make sure people, people out. Make sure people aren't lost. Make sure there's no fire or yeah, whatever okay. happens. So, 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 it's, I, I get, so I'm with you there. So mm-hmm. that's, that's uh, annual appropriations. And the key is, is that if Congress does not act or if Congress and the president can't work something out, that part of the government shuts down at the beginning of the new fiscal year, which is October 1st. Okay. okay. What often happens is Congress is behind on their work, and they're coming up on It's late September. They haven't passed one or five or all 12 of the appropriations bills. And what you hope is, at least, that they're working hard on it. They're negotiating. They're trying to work something out. And so what they do is they basically agree to a temporary truce. They say, look, we're going to agree to just continue funding the Interior Department for a week at last year's spending levels. We're not going to reprioritize anything. We're not going to shut any money around. We're just going to do a a one-year continuing of what we did last year while we try to finish the Interior Appropriations Bill. That's a continuing resolution designed to prevent a shutdown of the Interior Department. Okay, got that. That's very different. Than what Completely we're about. different than what we're talking about yeah. now, which is Treasury literally not having enough cash on hand to pay the money that they are authorized and, in fact, obligated to pay. So let's take one more step back. Uh, you made a distinction. I just want to finish this point and then add one more point back, which is there's discretionary spending. Which, again, I hate that phrase because, of course, it's all discretionary. But, but what that phrase has come to mean is that uh, there's legislation that's passed about programs, food stamps, Medicare, uh, and various other programs, they're written into law that if you do X, you get Y dollars. And unless Congress changes that 
legislation, those programs were, quote, non-discretionary. That's called mandatory spending because it's built into the way the programs have been shaped. Correct. This is, this is, it's an artificial distinction. I understand. That's, I, that's a, a created, it's a manufactured artifact of, of the way the laws have been written. But you're right. Annual appropriations, if Congress and the president do not act, no money is spent. Mandatory spending programs, almost all of which are entitlements, tend to be determined by formula, the way you've described it. If you meet criteria X, Y, and Z, then you are entitled to a certain benefit or a certain dollar amount. And the key is that they're determined by formula and that they are continuing programs unless the government changes them. Right. So the, the default is the status quo. Is continue to spend the money according to the formula. So, But next year... Uh, uh, let's say fiscal year 2012, which is rapidly approaching. That starts October 1st. Congress could decide today, or I may, I may get the timing wrong, but so maybe it's for 2013. But Congress could decide to raise the retirement age of the Social Security program by one year. They have the discretion, even though it's not discretionary spending, it's called mandatory. They have the discretion to change the shape of that program. Uh, they could change the retirement age, the benefit formula, and that could be true for all the things we're talking about, including uh, pay to soldiers and a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, pay to soldiers is a bad example because that's not in that's in discretionary, I presume. Right. So, but sticking with these programmatic uh, the mandatory spending, the entitlements. Yes. Now they can do that. When can they do that? Whenever uh, they can do that, any time they want, as many times as they want. Or they can ignore it for years. Correct. Okay. So I just want to make sure. I want to know what the level. So there is discretion about those mandatory programs. Absolutely. But it's often chosen to the, be. The only ignored. difference is the default. Correct. If, I understand. If, if Congress were just to go home and not do anything for the remainder of this year, all of the annually appropriated so-called discretionary programs would shut down on October 1st. Because they have not agreed on any of them? Uh, they have not agreed on anyone because this, the Senate hasn't actually passed any of them. So uh, let's. So that's my back. Let's back up now and get that straight. And I have to say that we're about uh, twelve minutes into the podcast, and I've already learned a lot. Uh, so I'm I'm doing well. I hope you out there are also learning something. Um, this, what's give me the sequence of budgetary activity in terms of voting and approval? Uh, if all were, quote, normal, whatever that means. You said the Senate has to approve something? So, so the, the normal process is the president submits his budget in February. Which he did. President Obama did. I've seen that. I've seen that document. It's and at whitehouse.gov. It's a big, and it's if you were to print it out, it's thousands of pages long. It's Well, the PDF on the web is 216 pages, I think. It's a short there, version. There are appendices that, okay. that provide almost infinite amounts of detail. And that, I just correct That is sorry. a proposal. And that proposal is, this year, the one I saw as spending for the coming year and nine more years after it. Correct. Which are years that President Obama, unless the Constitution has changed, will not be president. Correct. But, <laughs> but, but that's, that's traditional. I understand. The president right. submits a budget which right. goes for five or ten years. Okay, after the so he has done that. Correct. He did that. Um, now, the president is required by law to make that budget proposal. But if you think about it, you could put together your budget and submit it to Congress if you want it. Okay. It would have okay. almost the same legal force. It is it is a proposal. It's, hey, Congress, here's what I think you should do. Mine would be smaller, just for the record, but uh, um, his is $46 trillion over 10 years. Right. Now the, um, but the power of the purse, of course, the power to spend money and to collect taxes, that's, that's Congress's job. Okay. So they have, um, to, they have to figure out what to do, what to do with it. Now, um, uh, the president did something different this year, which is then a couple months later, he offered what he calls a second proposal. He came in and he, he argues that he modified his budget. He laid a new plan out there. Now, there's a debate as to whether or not his new ideas that he put forward, I think it was in March, were sufficiently detailed and sufficiently precise enough to constitute a new plan. It's certainly not the same level of details. The not even February. Cool. Not Let's even put cool. that to the side. Let's set that aside. That, that's, po- that's politics. And- okay. So normal process, the president proposes his budget in early February. Then the Congress first works on what's called the budget resolution. The budget resolution is like a blueprint for a house. When you, when you put together the blueprint for the house, you're deciding how many square feet is the house, how many floors are the house, 
how many rooms are in the house, and how big each room is. Yep. And, which not, is, yeah, and how they're shaped relative right. to each other. Yep. You're, you're not deciding all of the details of each room. Correct. Okay. When Congress approves the budget resolution, and it is only the Congress that, that does a budget resolution, the House approves, they pass a budget resolution, which looks like a bill. It's basically tables of numbers and procedural rules. But the House passes one in March or early April, the Senate passes one, and then the two of them are supposed to work out their differences. In conference. In a conference committee. Right. Yeah. And then if they work out their differences and the House and the Senate pass both, both pass the same budget resolution, then you have one blueprint for spending and taxes for And the, the president has to sign that? No, that no. does not go to the president. It's okay. a Congress-only document. Okay. Okay. Um, that process... That's, but that's... How does that relate to the 12 bills... I'll get there. Okay, sorry. Okay. Uh, no, no, that's okay. Um, that process would normally be led by the two budget committee chairmen, Paul Ryan in the House, a Republican, and then Kent Conrad, a Democrat in the Senate. So Paul Ryan, when you heard about the Ryan budget and the House right. passing the Ryan budget, that was the House doing the House budget resolution. Did they do that? They did. When did was that? They did that in probably April, I okay. think they got it done. Um, and they passed a budget resolution based on a blueprint that Paul Ryan had put forward. Uh, the Senate was supposed to do the same, uh, but they have not. If they had, let's put in a quote, normal year. If they, they had, they should have then taken that conference. and go in a conference with Paul Ryan. Paul right, Ryan and Ken business. Conrad would be the principal negotiators. Right? They would try to work out some sort of compromise between the two. And then you'd bring that compromise back to the House and Senate floors and try to pass it through both. And both if they months. did? If they did, then Congress has agreed upon the blueprint. And that blueprint basically sets the parameters for all of the legislative action on spending and taxes. And that's going to that's gonna restrict what and it, constrain the 12 appropriations. What it does is it says we're going to have one floor of the House, if you will, that's for discretionary spending, for annually appropriated spending. The budget resolution decides the total for all 12 of those bills, and it also off, often specifies a dividing line between, say, defense and non-defense. Okay. That's then given to a totally different committee, the Appropriations Committee, and the Appropriations Committee takes that total and divides it up into 12 slices. Got it. Each, each size of a slice then becomes a bill. And then you have 12 individual bills that move through the and process. If those bills all pass, then if the those bills pass, them, the president signs them, then you have 12 yeah. individual annual appropriations bills, and those parts of the government funded by that continue operating the way they normally should. Now, um, how long has that process been in place? Since 1974? Right. The mid 1970s. Now, that's a really. I don't want to go into what was like before that, because that's going to be another podcast, uh, and maybe before your time. But in 19... One, I've noted, and i the only person I think that, that I've noted uh, to note this, I must not be the only person, but I've not seen anyone else notice. this. Starting around 1974, the U.S. government um, started running deficits pretty, pretty systematically, suggesting... It could be a coincidence, of course, uh, but it could be that the very process itself is not uh, a healthy uh, pro- It's a very different process than the process that was before. And it strikes me as remarkably cumbersome. Uh, the Senate hasn't, you said, excuse me, it's cumbersome in years where the House, Senate, and President are all different parties. Even when they're the same party, they can disagree all, for all kinds of reasons. But right now we're in a world where the House is controlled by the Republicans, the Senate by the, by the Democrats, uh, it's not surprising that that can lead to conflict that is hard to resolve. But you're, what you're telling me right now is that, and I've read this, it's weird, why hasn't the Senate put forward their own budget? Uh, now, you have Republican sympathies, so try to speak. I do. Um, you'd have to ask um, Senator Reid, the Senate Majority Leader, and Senator Conrad. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what do you think they'd say? They would say that, um, I think they would say, and I think they have said, um, that there's no need for them to do a Senate-only budget resolution when, in fact, the budget decisions are being made at a higher level, are being made in these negotiations with the House and the White House. So this process could... I don't buy that argument, but I think that's the argument that they would make. But, But the bottom line is... 
we don't have a plan for our... You and I started this conversation, it's about October 2nd. We've digressed for those of you listening at home. We're really talking about October 1st now, a separate problem. So uh, that's interesting, uh, informative, and surprising to me. And uh, as we'll try to put something up uh, on the links related to this podcast about this strikes me as unusual situation where the Senate has not put forward something that could be then compromised with the House and that would go to the president for signature and those. No, go on to the 12 bills, et cetera. But now let's go back to August 2nd. So on August 2nd, um, it is expected that if nothing is done, that is, if the debt ceiling is not raised, the federal government will not have enough money to cover its obligations. These include debt obligations plus outlays that are budgeted, the appropriations that have been agreed to from the past uh, discretionary spending bills and mandatory uh, entitlement spending, correct? Correct. The way I think of it, yeah. since Congress is expected to be on recess, is... When is that? Uh, I think Roughly. at the very end of July. Okay. Um, I think of it as sometime in August. Okay. Right. Treasury tells us August 2nd. I don't think they're lying, but there are judgment calls and there are estimation There's questions. Some ambiguity. But the mushiness doesn't really matter that much because whether it's August 2nd or August 9th or August 16th, it's still sometime in August after Congress has supposedly gone on recess. So the mushiness doesn't really matter that much. Okay, so um, they would go on recess for how long? Uh, Basically the month of August. They come back right around Labor Day. So it would be slightly awkward if they said tomorrow... Uh, we're going on recess, and August 2nd came along, and uh, the Treasury couldn't cover its obligations. Right. So, there, so there are two reasons why I don't actually worry about default. Okay. Right. One is that if Treasury and OMB, if the administration ever did get put in the situation where they had to choose between default and some other bad policy like delaying reimbursements to states, there's no doubt in my mind what they would choose. They would delay reimbursements to states. They yeah, well, would do anything other than default. Let's back up. But, yeah. the, but the other one is that the leaders of Congress cannot possibly go on recess with this uncertainty out there in the markets and I understand. everybody receiving they would be, the checks. The political costs would, they, be, they would be They would be destroyed. So I don't actually worry about default because I know that if Congress cannot work something out, they will have no other option but to delay the start of recess. They'll well, have to stay until they work out some even just temporary solution. Well, that's what people say about the NFL uh, situation, too. I mean, there's no way they're not going to come to agreement, but they haven't managed it yet. Uh, but let's talk about this one, and then let's talk about default, or what you might call semi-default. Um, let's say they can't agree by... The date they don't go into recess, but they can't agree. They they cannot come to an agreement, and as a result, uh, this thing happens on August second or August fifth or August first or whatever, where the government can't cover its obligations, all of its obligations. You're suggesting well, the 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 last thing that would happen would be a, a, a literal default where they didn't cover the debt payments and uh, the interest and principal that they've promised to pay to. Lenders, correct. Owner, uh, holders of U.S. Treasuries. That's that's the judgment I'm making about the judgment call that I think the administration would make. I understand. That's yes. a prediction. Yep. However, so so the first question is, what options do they have? You said there's a list. They've exhausted some of those things on the list. What's left uh, on uh, when push comes to shove and it turns out, uh oh, there's not enough money in the till to pay everything. You're saying they would probably still pay almost certainly, uh, the principal and interest on the debt. What else would they certainly pay, or what other options would they have when there's not enough money to go around? So they have, they have two types of options. They have debt management options, and then they have cash management options. The cash management options is saying, we're going to delay paying X. We'll pay them a week later or two weeks later or a month later than we normally so do. that's a short-run solution. All of these are short-run solutions. Um, the debt management things tend to be more complex. For instance, uh, the Treasury is supposed to make cash payments into a retirement fund for government employees. And they're supposed to do that on a regular basis. What What, in fact, Secretary Geithner has done, as his predecessors have done before it, 
is they've declared a debt suspension period where they've said, we're not going to credit, we're not going to put that cash into the civil service retirement fund. We'll do it later. We'll do it later. When, when, when times are rosy. We'll, we'll just remind ourselves that, that we owe money to the civil service retirement fund and we'll pay it back once we've gotten past this debt limit crisis. Secretary so Geithner, that, that's still he's, available? He, well, he's already done it. Yeah, that's We're in a debt suspension period right now. Oi. He could choose <laughs> to extend that. He could say, I'm going to do that for the next six months. Or Isn't that in year. his August 2nd calculation already, though? Um, it's in his August 2nd calculation is doing a debt suspension period, I think, up through the end of July. He could, if he wanted to, make a judgment call and say, but I'm going to continue okay. that practice okay. in the future. You're grimacing. It's bad policy, and it really is. Um, and at some point, the lawyers at Treasury will say, look, you're really stretching the bounds of what we're legally allowed to do. And it appears that the Secretary's made a judgment call saying, look, I'm going to do this through the end of July and not beyond that. But that's a debt management option. Uh, so that would, okay. So, But if you're looking at cash management options, who are we going to delay payments to? Seniors. No, no probably I, not. No, I assume, what the, I assume they'd probably start with the states. Yes. Right. Is the federal government writes big checks to reimburse states for the federal share of Medicaid, welfare, unemployment, uh, highway obligations, all sorts of things which are joint federal state responsibilities. I assume that they would do what they often do, which is when they get in trouble, they they'll shift their problems to another level of government. Of course, uh, many the, gov- states the governors push- will scream that will that will really hurt states that are already in tough fiscal binds of their own. Um, But we are talking about sort of hypothetical in extremist situations, by the way, which I don't think we'll get to. But So all these options that are available to the Treasury uh, are pretty unattractive. They're all very unattractive, actually. So, so, though you said a few minutes ago, we're not going to default in the literal technical sense of the term both markets and the world and life would view those other options as not good. Correct. So so if I could, let me just comment a little bit on the administration's language and the way they've been framing it. I think it's, I, I think it's not good that they've been talking about default because they know that if push comes to shove, they won't actually get to default. And if you know that the alternative really bad scenario is slowing down payments to states, or something other than shocking the financial markets, you shouldn't go out there and tell the financial markets that you might stick it to them. But I assume so far that hasn't cost them, uh, it, it in the sense that the financial markets have, have not shown that, that they're alarmed by this. Uh, I don't know. I haven't looked at, the, at the, the, the metric of that in the market recently. But I do think that if I could just... Isn't, isn't it just what, a negotiating ploy? It is a negotiating ploy. Which is what ploy. the Republicans are doing too, and they say we're not going to raise taxes a penny. And maybe they mean it. You know, People say they're intransigent. I assume it's just they want to get more than less. But the, uh, Correct. My problem is with the nature of the threat that they're making. Right? When the president said, look, if we don't do this, there might not be enough cash to make to pay Social Security benefits. Which he did say. Which, which he did say. Me. In my view, that's a perfectly legitimate threat to make. It's terrifying to members of Congress. It's real serious policy damage. And it's one that I imagine the administration might actually consider doing if they were pushed to this. But since I don't think they would ever actually default on interest and principal payments, I think it's irresponsible to make that threat. Well, they could, obviously. They could make a judgment that it's better to antagonize the Chinese than it is um, Aunt Mabel in, in Peoria. But as, as a policy, uh, in terms of the policy consequences, I cannot imagine they're different. the administration doing that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> one, is, one is direct real pain to millions of Social Security beneficiaries right. who will call their member of Congress and, and, by the way, and be genuinely hurt yeah. in a lot of cases because no, no, some of them are, are counting on that money to pay rent and food. Yeah, yeah, it's not like um, but the other is you are taking a risk of another global financial shock. Yeah, no, that's um, true. With potentially catastrophic consequences. For everybody, not just old people. But um, let me let's step out of this conversation. What we're going to move to next for those of you listening at home is I want to talk now about we're going to turn to the um, issues of what we hear in the press about cuts and, and balance and, and the threats that both sides. 
excuse me, both sides are making. But can, can I make one 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 concluding point on the on yeah, the sure, second? Sure. Um, while I don't particularly, uh, while I don't like the threats that they were making, I think there's mushiness to the August second deadline. I actually, support the idea of an early August deadline. I think it's useful to have that forcing mechanism. Absolutely. And so all of the things that they're doing in terms of the way they're talking about it and all of these debt and cash management options, those to me are all less important because I actually support the overall goal of let's create a deadline to try to force these hard choices to be made. And and the hard choices are going to be presumably raise the debt ceiling so that we don't have to face the choices, but get something, a set of, of cuts or, or cuts some kind of fiscal reforms to accompany yeah, that. Okay. Um, but the question I want to stop for a second about the, the other, the digression I want to, I want to get to is um, what's it like in Harry Reid's office and Paul Ryan's office uh, these days? In other words, who's knocking on the door? Who's calling? Obviously, there are and, and what are they doing? Are they, how much do they go out into the into their colleagues' offices to either via the staff or themselves personally to f- feel the pulse of this? So obviously, when, when nobody wants to not pay s- seniors, that would be a bad thing. Uh, they're social security checks, and I assume that when the president says something like that, or or when it's just in the news, that people are calling these key folks, as well as their own representatives, are saying, hey, don't do this, don't do that. How does the, as someone who's been in that office, what's going on there? What's it like? And you're also negotiating. You're spending a lot of time as a staffer, certainly with fellow people at your own party, but you're also, aren't you going across the aisle and feeling them out? And right. What's so, going on? So, so the, the, the negotiations, it's it's... Above Paul Ryan's level now, right? This has been for the House Republicans. It's been the Speaker and Majority Leader Cantor. Okay. So this is being done at the Boehner and at Boehner's the Speaker of the House, right? Speaker Boehner, Majority Leader Cantor, uh, House Minority Leader Pelosi, and then Reed and McConnell. But you say above his level. level, they who he's very familiar with the numbers, right? Because he quote his plan, but he also he was whether, whoever it was. Even if it wasn't, quote, his plan didn't have his name on it, he was the person doing all that. that well, but all of those leaders, they each will have a budget staffer. Okay. I used to be that budget staffer for Trent Lott when he was Senate Majority Leader, who can provide the leaders with the substance they need okay. for the negotiations. And then to the extent that they need more help, um, or just because maybe they want to consult the, the committee chairman, they'll loop in Paul Ryan, right. and they'll say, hey, we're thinking of doing X, what would the numbers be, or how would you do it? Or they might reach out to Dave Camp and say, suppose we were to cut a deal on taxes. Who's Dave Camp? Uh, Dave Camp is the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. Okay. right? How should we think about a deal on taxes? What are important principles to include in it? So the leaders of the party, um, both because they need the expertise and because they want to have the support of key members within their the yeah. groups that they represent, um, are if they're good at their jobs, and I think most of them are very good at their jobs, they are reaching out to the members that they represent and saying, hey, look, I'm representing you. Um, here's what I think I'm doing, or here's what I'm getting from Harry Reid, or here's what I, we're getting from the president, um, and they'll do those consultations. Because the leaders are really just their agents, their negotiators on behalf of Large groups of because they got to get it passed, correct? Because if n- nobody wants to negotiate, saying if you do X, I'll do Y, and then find out that Y is not acceptable to the to the House. Correct. So one of the things you read, um, which I always wonder about, is you know, say, well, you know, the Tea Party is uh, putting a lot of pressure on these freshman Republicans. So how that uh, that I understand? They write letters. They what goes on in that building? Right. So the between those folks, the, the key is is that the members are all talking to one another. Where the members of Congress. Um, a lot of it is occurring on the floor of the House and the floor of the Senate. This is buttonholing. This um, is just standing well, around this, the water cooler. This is, uh, well, the key is um, that they vote several times a day. Uh-huh. And so the members are all off in their offices or their committee hearings or they're meeting with constituents or they're, give, they're giving speeches. They're doing whatever they do. And then the bells ring and there's a vote on the House floor or a vote on the Senate floor. And the members come from wherever they happen to be to the floor of the House of Representatives or to the floor of the Senate, and they cast their vote. And it's 15 or 20-minute window. 
and you have to get there during that window to cast your vote. Well, so that's when you bump into other members, and that's when you have conversations about what's going on. Or maybe um, if the if uh, Eric Cantor, the House Majority Leader, goes down to the floor, he would certainly have half a dozen members um, queuing up to talk to him to say, hey, look, I read in the paper that you said X. Um, you're not going to have me on board if you actually do that. But there's... 435 representatives, uh, some number greater than half are Republican. I don't know the number. Uh, How do they, they don't sit in a big room on Tuesday morning at 7.30 and for breakfast and have a a, a brainstorming session. So there there are organized structures to deal with this. So um, in the House, of course, you have Speaker Boehner, you have the Majority Leader, Eric Cantor, and then you have the Whip, Kevin McCarthy. And the Whip's job is to round up the votes and to count the votes. He is both the intelligence agent to know what's going on among those 200 and, what is it, 40-something House Republicans, and it's also his job to try to get them to vote as as a group when a big vote is coming up. And Kevin McCarthy has a team that's called his whip team, and his whip team are a bunch of other members, a bunch of other House Republicans, and they divide the Republicans up. So if you are a congressman, if you're a Republican congressman, and you're a member of Kevin McCarthy's whip team, you might have 10 to 20 members who you were assigned to. And so what might happen is uh, the speaker might say, look, we need to get the feel of House Republicans on the following question. He calls up Kevin McCarthy and says, here's the question I want you to whip. Uh And then Kevin McCarthy and his lieutenants will go out, and those members actually have to find the people on their list and say, this is the question that we want to know the answer to. So there's a lot of back and forth, obviously. Information is flowing up and down. And in addition, um, the good leaders will do um, meetings with groups of members. Right? They'll say, look, uh, we've been doing a lot of negotiation. I haven't talked to the freshmen in a while. Let's bring in, we've got you know, 30 or 40 freshmen. Let's divide them up into a couple groups, and I'll just do meetings with 10 or 15 of them at a time. Or I haven't, I haven't met with the moderates. I haven't met with the Northeasterners. I haven't met with this group. And so they're, they're constantly doing those, those meetings to get the feel of what's going on and share information. So they're, yeah, they're gathering information. They're also marketing. They're also saying, I'm, you know, I'm getting pushed on this. It's the best I think they're we can do. They're communicating with their members in both yeah, directions. Yeah. Okay. And what role do constituents have in that whole process? Obviously, that's going on in the background the whole time. Well, their role is principally through their individual member of Congress. Right. Right. And so they're, they're calling up the member or their staff or they're writing letters and, or they're writing an op-ed in their local paper right. um, saying, here's what I think my, my representative should do. Um, so they're trying to influence one person in right. that big discussion. So let's now let's move on to the actual uh, where we are today in the towards the end of July and the things you hear floated in the press. And if we have time, we'll get to the McConnell proposal, which you're the only person I've read that actually I think understands it. And I just want to say uh, when, when I spoke to Keith uh, a few days ago about whether we should do this podcast, I said, "How come there's so much misinformation and disinformation and ignorance about this issue?" And I think you said. Well, there aren't that many people who understand it, and about half the people who do can't describe it because they're in the middle of it, right? They're, those staffers we're talking about, those, those folks. So um, let's move to what is actually going on and what the threat points of possible negotiations are over. What we hear about, which I find um, at first, um, there's sort of two levels I find it confusing or or deceiving, deceptive, we hear about the Republicans saying that we're, we're only going to agree to a, inc- oh, by the way, who, who votes on the, on the ceiling being increased? The debt limit increase? Yeah. It is a bill that becomes a law. So the House, the Senate, and then the President has to sign it. Okay, so the House, being Republican, is, is seen, I think, correctly as, the, as, as holding the, the Every, all three of those groups have a potential veto of one kind or another. Correct. The president has a literal veto. But if you, th- if you think of this as a spectrum, you have sort of at the end of the spectrum, House Republicans at one end, and then the president at the other end of the spectrum. Right. And the negotiation, if, House Republic, if enough House Republicans and the president agreed on something, 
you would probably get it's the support in the Senate and enough right. Democrats and other Republicans to go along. So the Republicans' negotiating position has been no tax increases, which obviously there's some ambiguity about what is a tax increase, and we'll probably get into that. But their position has been we need we are only going to accept an increase in the debt ceiling if we get sufficient budget cuts. Correct. Uh, the the what they've said, and the speaker laid this out, is we have to reduce spending by at least one dollar for every dollar that the debt limit is increased. Right. Which so is, if you, if, are, there's a certain logic to that because a dollar a dollar. There's but but I'm not sure that's the right. That would be my first choice. But that's one. That's offer. that's how he laid it out, and that's the. That's the principle that's been governing the House Republican position in, in negotiations. So, but what you hear about is that... And no tax increases. And no right. tax increases. What you hear about, for example, is um, some people have offered a couple trillion in cuts. And again, these are all over 10 years. So uh, the U.S. government's spending roughly $3.5 trillion. Uh, $2 trillion over 10 years is $200 billion. That's not a very big number in a 3.5 trillion dollar budget. But the bigger, so I have two problems. The first one you have written about ably. So let's get into that. And then we'll get into the second one. The first one is what you call a cut depends on what you call the baseline. So for example, in the president's budget proposal of just to use that, because that's the only one I know about that's, well, there's also the Ryan plan, I guess we have two, we could at least we could talk about in the president's Plan. He proposes to spend forty-six trillion over ten years, which is four point six trillion a year. So a two trillion dollar cut from that lowers the average spending over the next ten years to four point four trillion, which to me is not much of a cut. I call that an increase from the current level of three point five, three point seven, whatever, whatever it turns out to be this year. So um, what the heck are we doing? Why are we talking about cuts? Why are we talking about the level of spending? Right. Uh, th- this is. Uh... Any smart shopper who goes into a slightly shady store and sees a sign that says 20% off yeah. um, from what? might be a little bit suspicious <laughs> because they might say, yeah, but did you mark up the price yeah. by 50% and then knock 20% off? Right. Um, and so that's the problem here. The, pro- the problem is, is that, um, and that this is not a Democrat or Republican problem. Um, the problem is, is that the way that we do budgeting in Washington, you are always starting from the assumption that... What we've been doing in the past, we'll continue doing in the future. And then we'll compare a proposal relative to that. Right? Which is not, seems like okay. Which is, it's called baseline budgeting, yeah. and it's a, it's, a, it's a reasonable way What's to do it. What's the problem with that? Um, the, the, the challenge is, is that you get into arguments about what it means to continue what we've been doing. Right. Um, the the area where this came up most frequently and most visibly was with the tax rates, um, the the battle that they had late last year. Um, we now have uh, individual income tax rates, which have been in place for more than ten years. These are the Bush. These tax are the, the what are, what are what are still labeled the Bush tax cuts right. um, of two thousand one and two thousand three, which the president. To the disappointment of his, some of his base uh, continued. He extended for extended, another, excuse ex- me, extended yeah. for another two years. Uh-huh. Right. Um, those tax rates are supposed to increase on January first, two thousand thirteen. So, current law says that tax rates will go up January first, two thousand thirteen. Current policy is the tax rates that have been in effect for 10 years. So the question is, when you're looking at a someone's tax tax, increase or not? When you're looking at someone's tax proposal, whatever they propose to do on taxes for 2013 and 2014, if you compare it to current law, you are comparing it to an area where the government, a, a situation where the government is collecting a whole lot more money because your starting point is tax rates have gone up. In January of 2013. Right. If you're comparing it to current policy, then you're starting from a much lower level of taxes collected by the government. And so if your policy is somewhere between the two, one person will say it's a tax cut relative to current law. Another will say it's a tax increase compared, compared to current, to current policy. policy. 
they will agree on what the proposal will actually <laughs> collect in revenues, sure. but because they're comparing it to different things, they will describe it as a tax cut or a tax and, increase. And, so th and that would be relevant for your forecast of the debt <clears throat> and, and annual deficits past 2013. But on the expenditure side, the issue that you've mentioned to me when we talked before is, is the war. Uh, war is a plural. So, for example, when someone says, I'm cutting spending $2 trillion, the question would be, what are you assuming on expenditures in Iraq and Afghanistan? If your starting point is, right, the president has announced a withdrawal schedule for Iraq and at least a couple points on that withdrawal schedule for Afghanistan. Right? The announced policy of the federal government is one that suggests that we won't be spending in Iraq and Afghanistan five or eight or nine years from now the amounts that we're spending today. Correct. So the question is, when you measure the cut, are you measuring that from a starting point where you assume that we're, that we're spending as much in Iraq and Afghanistan as we've been spending today, or do you start from a starting point where you've actually assumed the drawdown? And, and the danger is, is that some of that, say, $2 trillion in spending cuts may be mythical because you never really were going to spend that money anyway because everybody knows that you plan to pull out of Iraq and Afghanistan or pull a lot out of Iraq and, and Afghanistan. And, and you could, we could debate, we're not going to, but we could debate about whether it's realistic to plan to withdraw in, two, in five years or seven that's years. That's a separate or question. Is. That's a separate question. To me, what that, because that's an open question, right, we could... The debate could be, well, I really think we're going to be in Iraq and, and Afghanistan in, in 2017. So I'm, I'm worried there's a good chance we would be, because we certainly wouldn't have said in 2005 we're going to be there in 2013. But, but that's a different question. This is, this is instead just the question of when people are comparing budget plans, how do you measure it? Right. Whatever the policy is. But to is. me, given that, given that we could debate this and we're not going to... It seems to me that's why we ought to look at spending, not cuts from a baseline that could or may not or won't happen. I think I think it's uh, if you if you've got the bandwidth to do it, you want to look at both. Yeah, fair enough. Um, I I always start by looking at the amount of spending that the government will be doing, the amount of taxes that will be collected, because then I don't have to worry that someone's gimmicking me right. through playing games with so, the base. So while we're on this. Uh, a few months ago, the Congress agreed to cut $38 billion, and the CBO said, no, it's not $38 billion, it's $350 million, I think, was what they said. Was that one of these chemicals? No, that was different. Oh. Okay. Um, and that has to do with the way the government spends money and the timing of it. Um, if the government is going to uh, write a check to a senior citizen or pay an unemployment check, right? If uh, Congress says we're going to pay someone $100 in unemployment benefits, well, as soon as the government writes that check, $100 goes out the door. So Congress has made a decision to spend $100, and a check gets writ written for $100 almost immediately. A lot of what the government does, though, the cash goes out the door much more slowly. If the government's building an aircraft carrier, and it costs, I don't know, $100, million dollars to build. Well, it's a lot more than that. But if they're building some it sort takes, of... It takes three years to build it, and the payments take place over time. Right. And, and so they spend $5 million the first year, and $30 million the next year, and $40 million the year after that. And that $100 million flows out the door over four or five or eight years. What happened with that $38 billion is they said, you have decided to cut $38 billion, but the cash that's being reduced is going to be reduced mostly in future years. I got you. yeah. You're only reducing, you were only going to pay 350 million of that out the door um, this year. early. So I don't think that was a gimmick. I just think that was sort of people not understanding how the cash actually flows. Okay. Well, it was a gimmick, but it's a different kind of gimmick. There, there are plenty, no, there are plenty of gimmicks. This wasn't a gimmick. This is just, it, it was a mistake if, if, if the leaders were suggesting will be spending $38 billion less in cash this year. Okay, right. But I don't think they were saying it. I think people... It got interpreted. It. Okay. But, but, the, um, but the point we're, we're, we're talking about mainly is that when people talk about how much... When they wave around a flag that says, we've just cut X trillion dollars... you got to be very gotta, careful. Okay. And, and, and you've highlighted, I think, the most important 
some of the most important examples of, of where the gimmick on took spending place. It's, it's Iraq and Afghanistan is the big thing you got to watch for. And how how much money is that? I don't remember off the. It's top over a hundred billion. Yeah, I don't know a year, but I'm not sure it's a lot more than that. So it, it, that's a trillion dollars over ten years, though. It's real money. Uh, so that, that yeah, that is real money. Um, let's move. Oh, so I have one more technical question, and then maybe we'll close talking about the McConnell plan, and then we're going to get your forecasts of if you choose to give them about what you think will actually happen. Um, try to help me see how what I'm reading in the paper today about X trillion in cuts relates to the nuts and bolts of the budgetary process that we talked about at the beginning of the conversation. So when in the negotiation, let's say there's, you know, the, the, the Republicans want $6 trillion in cuts. I'm going to put taxes to the side. The Republicans want $6 trillion in cuts over the next 10 years, and the Democrats want $2 trillion, uh, are willing to accept 2 and they eventually compromise and they agree on 4 How does that get translated into either the appropriations bills that are going to have to supposedly get passed by October 1st versus in any programmatic sense? I mean, how do they manage to to do that? So if you were to try to... They're doing negotiations right now that don't fit within the normal budget process. Okay. That's fine. Um, If you were to try to then take... If you had a successful negotiation... If you were to try to take the results of that and push it back into the normal budget process, what you would have been negotiating was the blueprint for the House. Right. That first stage. Is, is the result of the agreement would then turn into the House and Senate budget resolution, which then all the processes are in place to figure out how that defines the appropriations bills and everything else. I'm really thinking about a different issue here, which is uh, sandbagging would be the, the phrase. How will the Republicans... By the way, I'm open-minded and agnostic about whether the Republicans really do want to cut government. They haven't. It's an interesting separate issue that I think there's a chance they'll actually do something because their brand name has been so degraded by past failures uh, and, and growth in government under their watch when they had control of the House and Senate and the presidency. So I, I, I'm, I'm very um, skeptical that actual cuts will take place. But suppose that is true in their mind. Suppose they actually negotiate real cuts. They don't do any of the gimmicks you're talking about. They really actually want to get government closer to its the, to the levels of spending of, of 2005 or 2007 uh, before the crisis, 2006 or 2003. Uh, how did they? How are they going to make sure that that actually happens? Given the number of steps that have to take place between now and, in other words, they they vote they they raise the, the ceiling. Six trillion dollars, or whatever it is, how are they going to get what they claim? To the, if you get down to the point where you are trying to seal a deal, the deal includes not just numbers, but agreement on processes, yeah, on an order of events, uh, and on the rules that will govern those those events. Um, so you make a decision that will take. We've agreed on these spending cuts. And we'll put them in a bill, which the House will pass first and the Senate will pass second. And all of that will get done by a certain date. And then if and when that occurs, then we'll move on to the second stage. So you're actually, so you're actually you are negotiating the, the, the rules and processes by which you will implement this agreement. And, um, and the members and their staffs all spend a lot of time making sure that they are covered in the contingency where someone reneges reneges or threatens to renege. Yeah. Now there's actually there's a there's a huge cost on Capitol Hill to reneging on your deal. Yeah. Um, you, you, may, you may you may negotiate in a nefarious way, you you may, you know, sure. really Send disagree with the person that are dishonest um, and, yeah. but actually breaking your word to another member is something that really gets punished within the confines of Capitol Hill. That being said, um, members are also very good at rationalizing and saying, well, technically I complied. Right. Um, and so people just make sure that the process is negotiated. Um, uh, actually, um, I put up the 1997 budget agreement that was negotiated between President Clinton, Speaker Newt Gingrich, and my old boss, Senate Majority Leader Trent Lott. That's, it's linked from my site. We'll put a link up to and it. And you can see 
It's probably, it's probably 20 pages, and three or four of them are process steps describing how, how this will be implemented. And all that was was a, that was a contract of sorts that you guys agreed on. The right. three, three parties said, this is... And, of course, that was, was that made public at the time? Mm-hmm. So it's, making it public, obviously, is a way of constraining yourself from Correct. reneging or your or counterparty from reneging. Um, it's negotiated like a bill or like a treaty, almost. Yes. Now... I raise this issue with some trepidation because it's quite complicated, but maybe you can give us some of the flavor. Uh, about a week ago, Mitch McConnell, who is one of the high-level negotiators, he's the Senate minority, minority leader. leader, correct? Um, Senator from Kentucky, Republican. He proposed something that, when it was described to me, sounded ludicrous. I thought, that's absurd. Uh, when I read about it uh, on your blog, it was... it's. Interesting. I wouldn't say it's a good, I'm not sure it's a good idea or not, but it certainly was different from what I had heard about and read about. So his idea, the way it was described to me was, oh, the, the, House, w- the House and Senate would vote to let President Obama raise the debt ceiling, and that way he'd be responsible politically for the outcome. So that sounded repulsive <laughs> so on all kinds of levels. It's not what he proposed, though. What, what did um, he actually propose? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try and describe it as best I can in a value-neutral way. Yeah, and, and by the way, for those of you listening, if you've gotten this far and, and you're sufficiently uh, uh, interested, I'm going to try to limit Keith's description of this because he could talk about this probably for half an hour. So we'll try to limit it to three or four minutes, and uh, then we can close with something else. And if in the course of the three or four minutes uh, your eyes glaze over or... It's too complicated. You're fascinated, but it's too complicated. Keith has laid this out in print very nicely, uh, in two or three pages. So, but try to give me a nutshell version. I'll try to give you a nutshell. Um, or a thumbnail, I guess. Uh, yeah. What it says is that Congress will give the president the authority to raise the debt limit. It, it's a transfer of power from the Congress to the executive branch. But with strings. With strings. Normally what happens is to raise the debt limit, Congress has to act, and then the president has to approve it. Congress has to pass a bill saying we're raising the debt limit, and then the president has to sign it. Under the McConnell proposal, Congress would give the authority to raise the debt limit to the president. They'd say, Mr. President, for the next two years, you can raise the debt limit in the following amounts and on the following schedule, and we will reserve to ourselves only the power to override it if we don't like it. So rather than we in Congress having to take an affirmative action to raise the debt limit, we'll stop you if we don't like it. So that sounds unconstitutional and politically uh, cowardly, but it's the strings that are interesting. It, it, so um, <clears throat> first of all, Senator McConnell emphasizes that, uh, I, I, won't, I won't say that he says he doesn't like it, but what he says is, look, the debt limit has to be increased for the reasons we talked about. For the reasons that we've talked about minutes. before. Yeah. And so I'm not optimistic that these negotiations are going to lead to anything. So this will probably work. He, he emphasizes that it's a fallback plan. And, that, um, and so sort of the response is, if you don't like McConnell's way of doing it, what other way is there <clears throat> of doing it that can actually pass the House and Senate? So you don't have to like the McConnell proposal to actually think that it has to get done. Um, it is constitutional. It's been done in other areas. Um, it's done for regulations. When the president implements a uh, regulation, there's something called the Congressional Review Act, which allows Congress to come in and try to stop him. Okay. This is modeled after that process. Um, but what are the, let's get to the strings. Um, the strings are that, uh, so first of all, it's time limited. Um, the authority expires in early 2013. Second is the debt limit increases can only be for certain amounts, right? Totaling $2 trillion, right? It's three, three chunks adding up to, to $2 trillion. Um, and then the third is that the president has to propose uh, spending cuts at least as large as the debt limit increase that he's asking for. That's in the original McConnell proposal. Subsequent to that, now Senator McConnell and Senator Reid are negotiating, um, the news reports are that they're negotiating two additional things. One is attaching some actually real spending cuts to the McConnell bill. So it wouldn't just be the McConnell process. It would be the McConnell process plus hundreds of, so billions will, of dollars of spending cuts. We, Congress, will give up our right to vote directly on this 
raising the limit if you if these spending cuts have the following place. spending cuts now and if promise you, some in the future that of and a if you magnitude. promise to propose some in the future okay. and then the other string that's being negotiated or at least that's being described as negotiated is maybe some sort of process whereby Congress will negotiate and consider additional spending cuts. Okay. I mean, I don't this is all predicated on the assumption that the uh, the ongoing negotiations aren't going to be successful. So let's put that to the side. I mean, I just I don't get the um, but that, that's interesting. I mean, it, it, it clears up for me what what seemed to be a rather um, bizarro move. It's still bizarre, but it's not bizarro. Um, let's um, we've got a couple minutes. What do you think is going to happen? We're just sitting here on July twentieth. There's maybe. Two weeks to go, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. Um, we're, we're watching a rather um, unattractive game of chicken play itself out. I assume you have friends on Capitol Hill who you talk to, get some information from. They're somewhat forthcoming, maybe not. Uh, what's going to happen? What's your best guess in any level of detail? I can see... Two paths that look fairly likely to me. Um, one is the McConnell path, or now the McConnell renegotiation path, um, which is the White House negotiations. All of those negotiations continue. They're ultimately unfruitful. Um, <clears throat> and something like the McConnell proposal, I think probably with some spending cuts, um, passes the Senate on a bipartisan basis, goes over to the House, um, and then uh, passes the House right before the recess, um, probably splitting Republicans, probably with a whole lot of Republicans voting no. Um, and that's one where, unlike most, most bills that pass the House pass on something close to a party-line basis, or everybody supports them because it's sort of non-controversial. This is one where if, if something like the mcconnell Reed proposal came over from the Senate, I could see it being sort of a 50-50 kind of vote where you've got almost equal numbers of Republicans and Democrats. That's a guess. So the, say the, the freshman Republican would, Republicans would vote against it because they say this, is, this isn't enough, it's not big enough. Correct. But, it gives, but that's an attractive political option. It gives them an out with their constituents. The leaders don't look like they're totally dysfunctional. They go home, and that gives them a month when they come back to pass those twelve appropriations. Correct. 12. That's tough for the lead. That's tough for the leaders in the House in particular, because then the people who they represent are splitting. Right. Right. Now their members may be perfectly happy with some of them saying, "Look, I'm okay voting for this because I think it's good policy," and others saying, "I think it's bad policy, but it's politically attractive to me to vote no and go tell people that I voted no." But it's still tough for leaders to have your conference split. Um, and I think that there are a lot of members, uh, a lot of House Republicans have been very aggressive in saying they don't want to shift that responsibility for the debt limit yeah, no, um, and the authority to the president. And they like the pressure that it keeps on spending. They, they yeah. think that it's, it's constructive and it forces, as ugly as these negotiations are, it is at least forcing the issue yeah. to figure out how are we going to deal with, with the high spending levels and the deficits that result from them. Um, the other, the other obvious option out there is the one that Charles Krauthammer has described, um, which is one where the House initiates, House Republicans initiate, a say he says five hundred billion dollar debt limit increase, tied with five hundred billion dollars of spending cuts. So that gets you three or four or five months. Um, the House passes that, probably with most Republicans voting for it, maybe a few Democrats. Um, and then they send it over to the Senate, and they dare the Senate to stop it. Um, and uh, while the president has said that he would um, not sign um, a short-term debt lim limit increase, I think that's a bluff. Um, and Krauthammer has said that he thinks that's a bluff. I think he's right. Um, <clears throat> what that does is that tees this up again a few months from now, but it keeps the pressure on to have more spending cuts. And it's sort of, that's a reaction against the mechanism that Senator McConnell has. But in the paper today, to add one more um, piece of jargon, the gang of six, which are six senators, three from each party? Uh, yes. I think it may be a gang of seven now, but it, it was the gang of six was three and three. These are folks who are, I don't know what distinguishes them. Let's ignore that. But 
In the paper day, there was the president is supporting their supposedly their plan, new proposal. Could that pass? Um, I don't think so. I certainly don't think it could pass the House um, because uh, because it raises taxes more than the president has proposed. Uh-huh. Um, and I think at least as important because it doesn't cut spending enough. Now, one thing we didn't talk about in all this was the president's role. We talked a lot about the Senate staffers. Presumably, the president has people on Capitol Hill right. with so what he wants. Right. So the president's team has Who's been... That? Who is that team? Um, the president's team has been um, his budget director, Jack Lew, his National Economic Council director, Gene Sperling, his Treasury Secretary, Tim Geithner, and then his Head of Legislative Affairs, Rob Neighbors. So that's sort of the core group. And they're the people representing the President in the Biden negotiations and in all of these other discussions. What are the Biden negotiations? Uh, the Biden negotiations were negotiations that have occurred over the past few months, led by the Vice President, created by the President, um, and it was the VP with those administration officials that I talked about, negotiating with uh, House Majority Leader Eric Cantor for House Republicans, Nancy Pelosi for House Democrats, and then the two whips, the two number two guys in the Senate, um, Senator Dick Durbin, um, who is Harry Reid's lieutenant, and then Senator John Kyle, who is um, Senator McConnell's lieutenant. So the, those people have been negotiating on a package of spending cuts, and the Democrats would say, and tax increases. Um, and if there are spending cuts attached to the McConnell proposal, it will be a subset of what the Biden group agreed to. So closing thing, we could think of there being four possible options that, that could happen over the next two weeks. Option number one is just a failure, leading to a default or a semi-default where the U.S. government doesn't meet its obligations in an attractive, responsible way which even if it's not a technical default, is not good for our reputation elsewhere. Uh, it basically sends a signal to the world that we can't run our, run our government, by the way. It's not so much people talk about, oh, well, our investors are going to get spooked. To me, it just basically says we're dysfunctional, which is not a good thing. So that's option number one. Option number two is something like the McConnell plan, where the House dumps the, um, some responsibility under the president for both raising the limit, taking the political responsibility, but also taking some cuts as well. Option number three is a short-term, three-monthly thing that the House puts forward, and it's better than nothing, so it passes, and then we fight, keep fighting. And the fourth option is something grander, that there's a meeting of the minds, there's X trillion cuts, maybe some tax increases, and the debt ceiling is raised and everything. Uh, I want to change your option one. Okay. Um, which is, I don't think that Congress will recess if they haven't done any of the other three options. So if they get down to, I don't know, July 31st or whatever their target, target recess One of them of those three will get done. Um, if, and if, if none of those three get done, I think what happens is they delay the start of recess and they pass a one-week clean debt limit extension. Of $200 billion. Or whatever it takes billion. to go a week or to go yeah. three or four days or five days, something like that. And then they keep negotiating. And okay. if they still haven't done it, they, so they go week by week through the August recess. I don't think that Congress actually goes home. Okay, so, but of the, then that doesn't, so we don't, assuming that you're right and that none of, that we don't get to the Armageddon August 2nd thing for whatever reason, the three types of options that are left are McConnell plus, McConnell plus, a uh, grand meeting of the minds, or uh, a three month, three month deal, temporary thing. Yeah. Those are so wildly different. How is that process going to get... There's no way to just... I mean, they're all kind of happening at the same time. It's part of why this is fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> it's ha- happening at, um, at the same time. They're being negotiated by different people. Yeah. Um, ultimately, it comes down to uh, three Leadership. people. It's our, yeah, but, but it's yeah. three people who, who really matter. Who are they? Um, the Speaker, because he decides what comes to the House floor. The Senate Majority Leader, because he decides, Senator Reid, he decides what comes to the Senate floor. And the Senate Minority Leader, Senator McConnell, because he can decide whether or not to let Reid do what Reid wants to do. Because he can, he can threaten to filibuster. So ultimately, those three people, notice I didn't say the president. Yeah, I noticed. Yeah. Right? Those three people will decide 
what comes up, which bills will come up, which will get voted on first, in what order, and how things will occur. Lots of other people are involved, but those are the three most important people. And, and no, you can't predict which of those outcomes will occur. Ultimately, it's not going to be a question of which outcome do you or I think is better. It's where are the votes? What do you have the votes to actually pass? And your bottom line is they're going to, they're going to pass something because the alternatives are too unattractive. And if they don't, they'll keep trying. Yeah. And it might mean that the August recess ultimately never occurs because they can't reach agreement. Although at some point the members get exhausted and someone gives in and says, right. fine, let's kick this can into September and then continue fighting there. My guest today has been Keith Hennessy. Keith, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.